Um, so today I will present some of our work on um, Sibatira, as you've heard. So Sibatira, and apologies in advance to those of you who have already seen some of these slides uh, from yesterday. So Sibatira is the most commonly reported marine toxin disease in the world. Um, it is associated with consumption of reef fish that are contaminated with the, um, a family of toxins called the Sibwa toxins. It's estimated that at least 50,000 people are affected by this illness uh, annually um, around the globe, although the actual number is likely to be much, much higher than that, and that's because the disease is under-recognised in um, non-endemic areas. Um, and due to the uh, diffuse nature of the symptoms, it is quite, quite commonly misdiagnosed, for example, as multiple sclerosis, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, or simple bacterial or viral food poisoning. And in endemic areas where Sibatira occurs naturally, the disease is also underreported, and that's mainly because there are no um, elevated treatment approaches, so people often just don't bother going to the doctor. Uh, so Sibatira naturally occurs in tropical and subtropical uh, waters, uh, which are indicated in the red shaded areas uh, on this map. But in more recent years, Sibatira toxic fish has also been detected in, in the temperate uh, waters, so for example, um, in the, um, the Bay of Sydney and also in the Mediterranean um, and around the Canary Islands. Which, um, so these regions are indicated in, in yellow. Um, and of course, with increasing uh, trade and tourism, you also get um, imported cases of Siwatira in, um, for example, Northern Europe um, and also the, the United States. So the Siwa toxins are lipid soluble polyethics that are resistant to heat, breathing, and stomach acid, and that's why you can contact Siwatira even though and you have perfectly well cooked um, fresh fish meal. And they are produced by benthic or uh, ground dwelling dinoflagellates, so microscopic algae, as you can see here. Most of these belong to the um, Dermophyscus species. They um, are named according to the ocean of origin. So, broadly speaking, there are the Pacific, Caribbean, and Indian sea toxins. Um, although the uh, Pacific sea toxin, one in particular, is the most well studied, the most potent, and also causes the most symptoms in the Pacific. So during Gambia discus blooms, uh, these microscopic algae attach themselves to coral, seaweed, and other algae. Um, and there they're eaten by herbivorous fish that feed off algae that's contaminated with Gambia discus. And in turn, these herbivores are then eaten by carnivores, and so seaweed toxins accumulate through the food chain, and they're also progressively um, oxidized to become more potent. Um, ultimately, consumption of fish that contains as little as 0.1 micrograms of seaweed toxin can cause seaweed tears. Uh, so as you might expect from seafood disease, sea bacteria at first presents with gastrointestinal symptoms. So you can get um, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain quite rapidly after consumption of sea toxic fish, so within about 30 minutes to uh, two days after um, consumption. And usually these symptoms resolve by themselves quite um, within a reasonable time frame, so they usually last less than a week. Um, however, the hallmark symptoms of Sibatira, and the reason why I became interested in this disease, are the neurological symptoms. Uh, they quite often occur with a, a delayed onset, so um, up to several days after consumption of fish, which makes diagnosis a little bit um, difficult at times. They can also be quite protracted, so they can um, uh, be troublesome for weeks, months, and for some patients they can even develop into a chronic disease. So the hallmark features here are paresthesias, um, so pins and needles. Um, you can get arthralgia and myalgia, so that's sore joints, um, sore muscles, um, pruritus, so itch, um, and, and uh, a pathognomonic symptom, um, which is uh, a symptom that is the defining feature of CYP here, which has previously been called temperature reversal. Um, but in actual fact, uh, patients who have CYP here are not um, unable to discriminate between hot and cold temperatures. They have what is um, known as cold allergenia. So this is a painful um, feeling in response to a normally innocuous cool stimulus. So what these patients report is, for example, that they're unable to drink a cool glass of water because it elicits such severe burning pain in, in their mouth and their throat. So this is known as cold allergenia. As I mentioned, it's the defining feature of um, Sibatira and the, the prime reason why we became interested in understanding how um, this happens at the molecular level. So the CY toxins are the most potent known activators of the voltage-gated sodium channel family. Voltage-gated sodium channels, um, probably all know, but I'll refresh your memory, um, that there are um, ion channels that are crucial for the upstroke of an action potential in neurons. 
Um, they are blocked by local anaesthetics, so you will appreciate that um, the reason why you uh, have a pleasant numbness when you go to the dentist after an injection of local anaesthetics is because you will watch that its sodium channels are blocked and your pain sensing nerves are no longer able to conduct action to patient. In humans, there are nine isoforms of these channels, uh, termed NAV 1.1 to 1.9, and they are between 70 to 90 percent identical, except they are expressed. Um, in different parts of the body and they have different um, functional roles. Now I just wanted to explain a little bit more about how um, pain signals are initiated and propagated in sensory neurons. Um, so very broadly speaking you can divide the process into um, an action, action potential generation or uh, what's called signal transduction. So this is where an external stimulus like um, heat or cold, um, chemical stimulus, um, you know, mechanical stimulus is transformed into an electrical signal. And usually this is um, a, what's called a, um, a generator potential, so it's a, a, an influx of um, calcium or sodium ions that causes the depolarization of um, the resting membrane potential, which brings it to um, a threshold for treating an action potential. And in this process there are a number of ion channels that are crucial. Um, and I want to draw your attention in particular to some of the um, transient receptor potential or TRIP um, family of ion channels. So TRIP M8, um, TRIP A1 and TRIP C5 are all cold sensitive ion channels. Um, TRIP M8 for example is activated by menthol and that's why when you have um, menthol containing toothpaste you feel a pleasant cool feeling in your mouth. Um, TRIP A1 is activated by noxious chemicals and also um, very cold temperatures so for example um, Horseradish activates trip A1, and so the burning sensation you get when you have too much horseradish on your sliced meats um, is caused by trip A1. And a more recently discovered one is um, trip C5, and we don't know very much about that yet. Um, on the other hand, you have um, heat or warm sensitive ion channels, so for example, the, the trip V family of ion channels. Trip V1 is probably one that you're also all very familiar with. It's activated by capsaicin which is the ingredient that makes chili peppers pop. Um, so these are heat sensitive ion channels and the overall effect is, as I mentioned, that you increase the resting membrane potential of these uh, peripheral nerve endings and um, you eventually trigger action potentials. Um, and these action potentials are then propagated um, along the axon of the sensory neurons and uh, two key um, families of um, ion channels involved in this process are the voltage scattered sodium channels or NAV and the voltage scattered uh, potassium channels or KV channels. Now of course things are really not as simple as that and um, sensory neurons are actually very heterogeneous. They're so heterogeneous that in fact we don't know exactly how many different types we have. Um, but they are uh, broadly classified um, based on um, whether they have uh, free nerve endings or uh, specialized nerve endings, so for example, you can have nerve discs or um, uh, for, for touch and vibration. Um, you can classify them based on uh, the myelination um, of the axon. So, C fibers um, have three nerve endings, they are unmyelinated, they usually have a, a small cell body and a small axon, and they slowly conduct uh, action potentials. And they're the, um, typically considered to, to be the main mediators of. Of pain sensation. Um, a delta fibers, in contrast, they also have thin nerve endings. They are thinly myelinated, medium sized, intermediate conduction velocity. They also signal pain. And lastly, you have a beta fibers, as I mentioned, that have specialized nerve endings. Um, they are the heavily myelinated, large diameter neurons with large diameter axons, and they have very fast conduction velocity. And it is thought, but um, hopefully. Today you will see that's probably not quite correct, um, but they usually mediate the sensation of touch. Um, and also I just wanted to mention at this point that this is also a gross oversimplification because there's many, many different subclasses of these neurons depending on what stimulus they respond to. Um, so despite the fact that we know that toxins activate voltage gated sodium channels, it was actually not clear how toxins cause pain. Um, and in particular, we were not uh, sure which sensory neuronal populations are activated by cytotoxins, and also the effect on um, each of the nine individual voltage gated sodium channel isoforms was not known. So the aim of um, our work was to determine the cellular and the molecular basis of cytotoxin induced cold allergenia and also cytotoxin induced um, pain. 
So one of the first experiments we did to elucidate whether the effects of serotoxin are mediated directly via effect of the peripheral nerve ending, or for example, due to um, all the pain signal focusing of the spinal cord or in the brain, um, was that we injected um, very small amounts of serotoxin by an intradermal injection into uh, the, the volar surface of the human forearm. So um, here you can see, I think, my forearm, this little black dot indicates the in injection site. Um, and what you can see uh, over here are laser Doppler images um, showing uh, blood flow. And so the, the brighter the pixels, the, the more blood flow you have. Now what you can see is that um, very rapidly after injection of serotoxin, so within, within a few minutes, you get this um, large area of enhanced um, vas uh, vascular profusion. And this is essentially called a flare, which is what you get um, after a bee sting. Now, um, that this flare can actually be explained by local CGRP. So CGRP is calcitonin gene-related peptide. Um, and over here you can see that ciguatoxin is very potent at um, eliciting CGRP release um, from the skin. And CGRP is well known to cause vasodilation. So this axon reflex flare is entirely explained by ciguatoxin activated sensory neurons, which in turn release this vasodilatory peptide um, and then cause, um, cause a flare. And we also are not showing it here, but there is no effect on histamine. So ciguatoxin has a direct effect on sensory nerve endings. <coughs> um, now the, the interesting um, part of that experiment in actual fact was when we um, evaluated the, the sensory response to um, different temperatures. So in the, in the white you can see the average um, pain rating um, when we decrease the temperature at, at the injection site from about 37 degrees to um, it was 4 degrees. And um, as you'll appreciate, as the temperature drops, the sensation becomes increasingly unpleasant. Um, now the interesting observation was that after injection of ciguatoxin, you get a profound sensitization um, to cooling effects. So at temperatures, for example, 30 degrees, all of a sudden you get this, a similar unpleasantness rating as you would normally see at temperatures of about 15 degrees. So that is showing that um, after ciguatoxin injection directly into the skin, cool actually becomes um, painful and unpleasant. And that provided evidence to us that ciguatoxin has direct effects at peripheral nerve endings. And so this allowed us to establish an animal model of ciguatoxin induced pain. Um, and what we did here was um, we injected um, ciguatoxin by a unilateral intraplantar injection. So that is basically a, a subcutaneous injection into a single hind paw. And what we observed um, was very similar to what um, the human experiments you know, showed. So um, injection of ciguatoxin um, initially caused spontaneous pain behaviours. So in other words, um, the animals would uh, lick, flinch and shake their, their injected hind paw. And this subsides over approximately um, an hour um, in a concentration dependent manner, I might add. And once the spontaneous pain behaviours have subsided, what you can see is that when you then ex expose the animal to a temperature controlled plate maintained um, at 37, 22, 20, 15, 10, and 5 degrees, um, you get the emergence of an increasing um, number of pain behaviours again. So this is representative of cold allodynia. And I should also mention at this point that these temperatures don't usually elicit any um, symptoms of um, aversive behaviour. Um, also interestingly, the cold allodynia induced by a single intraplantar injection of um, ciguatoxin lasted for several hours, um, but most of our experiments um, were conducted within um, the first two hours after injection. Now, um, we first wanted to assess what type of sensory neurons are activated by ciguatoxin. So the approach that we took was um, a high content screening approach where you can grow sensory neurons isolated from um, mouse muscle root ganglions um, in a dish. And each one of these um, cluster here is actually um, a different sensory neuron. We can then stimulate with ciguatoxin and measure uh, the response. So here you can see that if some individual neurons have very large and very rapid responses to ciguatoxins uh, and others um, don't respond at all. Um, once we've measured the response to ciguatoxin, we can then stain to various neuron markers. Um, so over here in the red, you can see um, that, for example, this neuron here, it's a bit shaky there, it's actually the same one as this one here. 
um, and this cluster over here is actually the same neural system. So we can then directly correlate um, expression of markers with the response to CYP toxins. Now what we found was that CYP toxin um, at one nanomolar activates about 51% um, of neurons at, of all sizes uh, and 76% of all neurons um, as you increase the, the concentration. And um, when we looked at various markers, um, what we found was that CYP toxin preferentially activates peptidergic um, trip A1 positive neurons. So peptidergic neurons are those that contain calcitonin gene-related peptides. Given that CY toxin is very good, as I've shown you, at eliciting CGRP release, this is perhaps not a surprise. Um, but we were quite uh, interested to see that um, nearly 100% of all neurons that express trip A1 responded to CY toxin. Now, if you'll remember, um, I mentioned that trip A1 is actually a cold sensitive neuron. Um, oh, sorry, not neuron. It's cold sensitive ion channel. It's um, expressed in um, peptidergic sensory neurons, and it's well known to be involved in sending noxious chemicals and noxious cold. So, as I mentioned, um, it's activated, for example, by horseradish and wasabi, but also compounds found in clove oil, uh, garlic, mustard, cinnamon, and ginger, and also um, by cold temperatures. So naturally, we thought that perhaps trip A1 was responsible for mediating the, the cold hypersensitivity induced by CYP toxin. Um, so what we did is we turned to um, a perfusion experiment again. Um, and here um, you can see the um, response of individual sensory neurons, again, to CYP toxin, which causes a, a, a wide range of different responses. We can then apply um, AIPC, which is essentially mustard oil, so that's um, the compound that will activate trip A1. Um, and this will identify the neurons that express um, trip A1. Um, and then uh, you can identify which one of these cells are actually neurons by stimulating with potassium chloride, which causes a, a membrane depolarization. And what we found was that um, the neurons that respond to AITC or mustard oil, so those that express trip A1, on average, had much larger responses to CY toxin, which you can see in the green, um, compared to those that do not. Um, so we next wanted to assess whether TRIP A1 um, might mediate CY toxin induced cold time. So again, these are the responses of sensory neurons. In this case, um, we stimulated with a decrease in temperature. So we went from 35 degrees to about 15 degrees. And you can see that there are some um, sensory neurons that respond to this drop in temperature with a large um, influx of calcium, actually. Um, and the interesting part was, <laughs> might not be very clear. Um, so after application of CY toxin over here, you can see that, for example, um, the purple neuron here did not have a response prior to application of CY toxin. But after perfusion with CY toxin, all of a sudden you get this very large um, cold-induced response. So this is suggesting that CY toxin causes cold sensitization of these neurons. Now when we quantify this, so each of these points is the response of a single neuron. Um, when we quantify this, what we actually found was that there was no difference um, in the responses to, uh, to cold uh, before and after CY toxin in cold sensitive neurons. So they were all the same. There was also no difference in the cold induced responses um, in neurons from trip A1 knockout animals. However, the really interesting part was that when we looked at cold insensitive neurons, we found that CY toxin caused a very profound cold sensitization. So previously cold unresponsive neurons now became cold sensitive. Uh, and this sensitization was almost completely abolished in neurons from trip A1 knockout animals, providing fairly strong evidence that, that this cold hypersensitivity is mediated by um, trip A1. So we next went to a, um, a technique that's called the single, single fiber recordings, and we used the mouse uh, saphenous uh, nerve skin capillation. So essentially what you do is you isolate the skin of a hind paw of a mouse um, together with the saphenous nerve attached, uh, and then you can record propagated action potentials um, after stimulating the receptive field um, of those neurons in the skin. Um, and the reason we went to this approach is because you can um, directly superfuse compounds and you can uh, measure the excitability of these, these neurons in real time. So I have a small video to illustrate um, the technique. <laughs> 
Stimulator and a, a recording electrode. And then up here you can see the action potential waveform, and each pin is actually an action potential because it goes through a loudspeaker. Um, then each action potential uh, becomes a dot on our screen and it's plotted as instantaneous frequencies, so the higher up the y axis, the faster the action potential will come in. And this is my post dot. So, we can use my own to like the allows you basically is to have a lot of fun with sensory neurons and to um, you know, tease apart what they respond to and what the, um, the excitability parameters are. Okay, so um, when we, oh, there seems to be some panels missing unfortunately, so you just have to believe me. Um, so when we applied cytotoxin to the receptive field of um, C fibers, so if you remember C fibers are the unmyelinated fibers that usually transmit pain um, signals. What we found that um, we got uh, a greatly induced um, spontaneous activity, and that was significantly reduced in um, the skin from trip A1 locker animals. Um, and we also wanted to confirm whether this um, reduced excitability in, in the skin and the nerves of these um, trip A1 knockout animals also correlates to decreased pain responses. Um, so we again went to our animal model, um, and so here in the white you can see the pain or the number of pain behaviors over five minutes after intraplantar injection of cytotoxin, and this was significantly uh, reduced in um, trip A1 knockout animals, and also after um, treatment with a trip A1 inhibitor, which is called HC0303. Not to worry. Um, interestingly, um, the other cold sensitive um, receptor trip trip M8 had absolutely no um, contribution to cytotoxin induced cold hypersensitivity. So um, the skins or the, the pain behaviors um, of trip M8 knockout animals were completely unchanged to wild type um, and treatment with a trip M8 inhibitor AMTB also had no effect. And there was also no difference um, in pain behaviors with trip C5 knockout animals, so this is the, the third cold sensitive ion channel. Um, and there was also no difference um, in trip one knockout animals, which is perhaps not surprising since we looked at cold behaviors. Um, now we thought perhaps there was a possibility that cytotoxin directly activates uh, these cold sensitive trip A1 channels. So we um, went to a, a cell model that overexpresses uh, trip A1. And what you can see here is that um, uh, mustard oil causes a concentration dependent increase in calcium influx. Uh, and this was actually completely unchanged in the presence of very, very high concentrations of cytotoxin in fact. Um, and there was also no direct activation of trip A1 channels by cytotoxin. So here you can see the, the lack of response to cytotoxin in trip A1 expressing cells, and in comparison, the response you get to, to mustard oil. So um, the model that's emerging of how cytotoxin causes cold pain is that. Um, you have activation of cold sensitive trip A1 channels by cold, um, and in, coupled with increased excitability of sensory neurons, which arises from the activity at voltage gated sodium channels, you then get um, hypersensitivity to, to cooling. Um, now, the next question we wanted to assess is which sodium channel isoforms actually contribute to this effect. Now, as you'll recall, I mentioned that there are nine different isoforms. 
termed 1.1 to 1.9. Uh, and they are expressed um, in different parts of the body, so NAV 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, and also 1.6 are found um, in the brain. What NAV 1.5 is um, a very important isoform for normal functioning of the cardiac action potential. Um, NAV 1.4 is the predominant isoform in skeletal muscle, um, and in sensory nerves you actually have uh, four isoforms that we think are particularly important, and they are NAV 1.6, NAV 1.7, NAV 1.8, and NAV 1.9. So, um, without going into too much detail, so what you can see here is the um, activation and inactivation um, the properties of each of the individual multistatic um, sodium channel isoforms, so 1, 1, 1, 2, through to 1, 1.9. Um, and the curves um, on the right is the um, voltage dependent activation of the channel. And the curve on the left is the voltage dependent um, inactivation of the channel. Um, in the black, you have uh, control responses, and in the open circuits, you have uh, responses in the presence of CY proxy. Now, um, without going into too much detail, basically, CY proxy had an effect at all of these channels, so there was really not much in terms of subtype selectivity. Um, there was a, a few highlights, so for example, uh, NAV 1.7. There was a particularly large shift in activation at um, a very small depolarizations, and in NAF 1.8, there was a particularly large shift um, at, at higher uh, depolarizations. But overall, the take home message from here is that it uh, see what proxy affects all um, isoforms of voltage scattered sodium channels. Uh, now, we turn again to measuring uh, sodium entry in cultured DRG neurons uh, in order to assess which one of these isoforms contributes to. Uh, the ciguatoxin induced effect. So here you can see the um, sodium influx induced by ciguatoxin in neurons from wild type animals, and again each drop is a, a single neuron. And you can clearly see that in neurons from NAF 1.8 knockout animals, the sodium influx was greatly reduced. Um, sodium influx was also greatly uh, reduced after treatment of these neurons with tetrodotoxin. So tetrodotoxin um, inhibits the tetrodotoxin sensitive ion channels. Um, which are uh, essentially in sensory neurons everything except NAF 1.8 and NAF 1.9. And so, so not surprisingly, when we combined a NAF 1.8 knockout animals and treated them with tetrodotoxin, we had almost uh, no responses left. And in contrast, um, NAF 1.9 um, actually didn't contribute um, very much to this effect at all. Now, um, we next wanted to use a, a pharmacological approach to dissect uh, the contributions of these individual isoforms to ciguatoxin-induced effects on sensory neurons and to pain behavior. Um, and uh, the way we did that is we used um, a couple of uh, different tool compounds. So, as, as I mentioned, the first one was codotoxin, which blocks um, 1.1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 6, 1, 7, but not 1, 8, and 1, 9. Um, we used a spiral venom derived uh, peptide, PM3A, which is very selective for NAV 1.7. We also used a new kind of toxin G3A, which at the concentrations that we used uh, selectively blocks NAV 1.6. And we also used a small molecule inhibitor of um, NAV 1.8, which is AA03. Uh, and unfortunately, there's actually um, no selective inhibitor known for NAV 1.9, um, so we sort of deduce the con contribution of NAF 1.9 by using a combination of all of these um, compounds. Um, so what you can see here is the um, response of C fibers uh, to CY toxins. So um, again, uh, each of these dots is an action potential and it, they are plotted as instantaneous fre frequencies. So um, the higher up on the y-axis, the faster the interval to the preceding action potential. And what you can see is that um, treatment with CY toxin um, basically induces the spontaneous firing um, uh, in, in C fibers. Uh, and here I, I'm showing you an example of a C fiber where um, the firing was essentially unchanged after inhibition of NAF 1.7, it's unchanged after uh, inhibition of NAF 1.6. Even tetrodotoxin basically had no effect. Um, but when you add a blocker of NAF 1.8, so A803, you essentially stop um, the spontaneous firing. And down here you've got an example of a sensory nerve where again ciguatoxin induces spontaneous action potential firing, but then when you put um, a superfused PMPA uh, on the receptive field, you um, inhibit the spontaneous activity. 
So we did this with a number of neurons, and the overall picture that emerged was that um, there was no significant difference uh, with any of these compounds except for AO3. So AO3 was the only one um, that significantly decreased spontaneous action potential firing except for the occasional neuron that responded to um, nafon 7 inhibition. Um, so it seems that nafon 8 is the key isoform that induces spontaneous activity in these pain sensing C fibers. Uh, and when we looked at A fibers, um, we found again that uh, actually a subset of A fibers responds to C white toxin in a very similar manner to the C fibers. So remember that A fibers are the myelinated fibers, and some of them um, mediate touch sensation, some of them mediate um, pain sensation. So C white toxin induced um, spontaneous action potential firing. Um, but surprisingly, what we found in the A fibers was that you could uh, completely abolish all um, spontaneous activity with inhibition of NAF1.7 uh, or NAF1.6. It actually doesn't matter which one you use. Um, so um, that you can see that here um, in this graph, so you get significant inhibition both with block of NAF1.7 or with block of NAF1.6. So going back to our behavioral model, we wanted to um, assess the contribution of tetrodotoxin sensitive and resistant channels to the different um, pain behaviors. So here you can see um, in the um, in the black dots the spontaneous pain behaviors after injection of CY toxin, um, which is prior to injection of TDS. So when we then give an intraplantar injection of tetrodotoxin, what you can see is that uh, the spontaneous pain behaviors are almost completely abolished um, compared to the same inhibitor control. So that um, is consistent with A fibers being completely blocked um, by tetrodotoxin. Um, and in contrast, um, cold pain behaviors at 15 degrees were actually um, partially resistant to tetrodotoxin, suggesting that um, this effect is mediated by C fibers. Um, so we wanted to uh, tease apart the individual sodium channel isoforms that contribute to this um, tetrodotoxin induced drop in spontaneous C toxin induced pain. Uh, and what we found was that, as expected, um, NAFLOC 10 8 has no contribution to C toxin induced pain, um, but, uh, and neither does um, another conotoxin, so NAFLOC 10 1 and NAFLOC 10 2 inhibition by conotoxin T3A also has no effect. But if we block um, either G3A, uh, sorry, either NAFLOC 10 6 with G3A or NAFLOC 10 7 with P and 3A, again we get almost complete abolition of the spontaneous pain behavior. So the in vivo study, studies very closely match what we see in the single file recordings. Uh, now the next um, question uh, we wanted to assess was um, the gastrointestinal effects of CY toxin. So as you'll recall very early on, I mentioned that CY hero is defined by gastrointestinal symptoms, including um, severe abdominal pain. So we wanted to assess the effect of CY toxin on colonic sensory neurons, um, and also what um, isoforms of the voltage gated sodium channel are involved in these effects. And here um, you can basically see a, a very similar setup to the single fiber recordings using the skin nerve prep, except this is a colonic nerve preparation. So you dissect out the colon and the splanchic nerves, and you can record propagated action potential um, from sensory nerves innervating the colon. Um, and again, what you can see is that CY toxin um, induces spontaneous action potential firing. Um, this neuron up here is actually what's called a silent nerve receptor. So it, um, it does not respond to mechanical stimulation. So colonic sensory neurons are actually um, insensitive to temperature. They only respond to mechanical stimulation. So this one is called silent because you can't normally activate it. Um, but after superfusion of CY toxin, you get um, activity of this previously undetectable um, nose receptor, the pain sensing nerve. Um, and also down here is a um, mechanosensitive nose receptor from colon. And again, you can see that um, Superfusion of CY toxin also causes this spontaneous um, action potential discharge. Um, so from the single uh, nerve fiber recordings from the skin, we, we thought that uh, the C fiber effect was mainly needed by NAF1.8. Uh, and the same uh, effect was actually observed in these colonic sensory neurons. So uh, treatment with the NAF1.8 inhibitor A803 completely abolished the um, activity of CY toxin on colonic sensory neurons. Uh, but I should mention that it still maintains normal responsiveness to mechanical stimulation. So you haven't just you know, abolished all um, 
uh, excitability of the neuron. So um, in summary, what we found was that it's actually very complicated. Um, different sensory neuron isoforms uh, and subtypes using different sodium channel isoforms mediate different symptoms of CYT. So there's a subclass of um, cold sensitive C fibers that uh, utilize nav 8 and trip A1 to cause cold allergenia. There's another subclass of actually cold insensitive A fibers that utilize nav 6 and that become de novo cold sensitive. So they also contribute to cyclotoxin induced cold pain. Um, you have a, a subclass of NAC1.7 and NAC1.6 expressing A fibers that um, contribute to non thermal and spontaneous pain. And another subclass of NAC1.8 expressing um, C fibers that mediate colonic pain. So I'm going to leave it uh, at this point for today. I'm sure you're all um, very intrigued about these sensory neurons. So I want to thank a number of people and um, in particular um, my mentor uh, Professor Richard Lewis who's been uh, working on CY toxin um, for many decades and uh, all of this work is, is done with material that he isolated from a ton of more you know, some 20 or 30 years ago and I also particularly uh, want to acknowledge um, Katarina Zimmerman from the University of Erlangen uh, who I've collaborated with for a very long time now and also uh, Professor Stuart Burley from the University of Adelaide who is an expert in in colonic sensory neurons. Um, I should also acknowledge um, funding um, from the Australian Research Council. Um, thank you very much for the attention. Uh, it is a very great honour to be a recipient of the Edouard Bell Quad Prize, uh, and I hope we can have a lively discussion coming up. Well, thank you very much.